All right, so uh, welcome to this uh, important event. Uh, we, uh, we are excited uh, to present some of our work and some of the general principles of treating epilepsy uh, and diagnosing epilepsy correctly and uh, the long journey that some individuals with epilepsy go through uh, in collaboration and you know, in a great teamwork uh, spirit with their uh, group of physicians. Uh, at GW, we are a uh, level four epilepsy center, which is the highest uh, designation uh, for, uh, for epilepsy centers by the National Association of Epilepsy Centers. Uh, we have a state-of-the-art epilepsy monitoring unit, and we've done all sorts of uh, epilepsy surgery and neuromodulation. That means deep brain stimulation using some devices to treat seizures, as well as a diet clinic for epilepsy. We're going to talk about all of this today. So I'm going to start with some quick overview about epilepsy, and then I will introduce my colleagues who will take it from there to tackle specific subjects. Uh, please uh, uh, don't uh, hesitate to type your questions, and we will address all of your questions toward the end. So let me start with this talk, Living with Epilepsy, Innovative Treatments and Therapies. Some generalities uh, to start with. What is a seizure? A seizure is an abnormal electrical activity in the brain. Uh, and uh, a seizure could be provoked by any, uh, uh, by multiple stimuli in any individual. Uh, if somebody takes a specific dose, high dose of certain medications or in people who use alcohol and then they regularly and then they uh, abstain from alcohol uh, uh, abruptly, they may have alcohol withdrawal seizure. People who have low sodium may have a seizure but a single seizure does not satisfy the diagnosis of epilepsy. Epilepsy uh, is, uh, refers to recurrent unprovoked seizures. So in somebody without any provoking factor, not related to alcohol, not related to medication, not related to head trauma, not related to some metabolic change such as low sodium or low blood sugar, they still have seizures that are recurrent um, that constitutes the diagnosis or satisfies the diagnosis of epilepsy. So. Uh, epilepsy is very common. Uh, it affects 1% of the population. That means in the United States, we have approximately 3 million or over 3 million individuals who have epilepsy. And about 1 million of them, or at least 900,000 according to uh, uh, statistics, they continue to have seizures despite treatment with medications. So medications are effective in only 60 to 70% of all individuals with epilepsy, which is great, but that means there's still uh, about one third who will continue to have seizures despite medications. And we call these individuals medically intractable, meaning medications are not sufficient to control the seizures. Medical intractability is defined as failure of two medications to control the seizures. And if somebody uh, tries two medications at good doses and they continue to have seizures, they should be evaluated uh, for possible epilepsy surgery if they have focal epilepsy. We're going to talk about this a little bit later as well. So uh, different causes at different age groups for epilepsy, for example, in the age group of less than 15 years, the majority are uh, idiopathic, meaning inherited. We don't know what, but there is some related to other uh, congenital problems, uh, you know, that the kids are born with or some brain tumors or abnormal vessels. Uh, in, in the later age group, 15 to 34, again, a lot is unknown, but some are related to trauma blood vessels, brain tumors, infections of the brain. And as you uh, go to the higher age groups, you will notice that this sort of uh, green section is increasing, which refers to vascular. That means uh, in people above the age of 64, uh, 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 stroke uh, becomes a major cause of epilepsy, as well as also some other uh, degenerative brain diseases, such as dementia, Alzheimer's, and others, as you see here, 12% in this statistic. Uh, and again, uh, seizures can occur at any time or epilepsy can occur at any time in somebody's life. It's most likely to occur in younger age groups. As you see here, this is the age and this is younger than 10. It's very high, but it also increases a lot later in life above the age of 65 and it continues to increase till age 80 and more. So uh, the older people and the younger people may be uh, most likely to have new onset seizures, but it can occur at any time in people's lives. And the causes are numerous. Uh, they can be genetic, structural, structural meaning there is like a, an abnormal uh, 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 part of the brain on MRI 
or it can be something related to a systemic problem such as a, a metabolic problem. Um, here's a, a, a one other thing that I think a, a lot of our audience probably knows is that not all seizures look like convulsion with uh, uh, muscle contraction and loss of consciousness and drooling or tongue biting. Some of them look like this. Let's play the video, uh, please. So here's a seizure uh, that manifests as confusion, lip smacking, you can even hear the lip smacking, very repetitive, fumbling with the hands as if the patient is intending to do something, but it's just purposeless movements. And then some posturing of this hand as if it's sort of uh, stiff. And that's it. And uh, whatever happens, that's it. So we can go back to the presentation. Whatever happens during a seizure of that sort, uh, the patient will not remember later. So this, this seizure, we call it focal impaired awareness seizure. And it's a seizure that often comes from the temporal lobe, which is right here behind the ear. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the most common types of epilepsy. So not all seizures are convulsive and manifest as muscle contractions. Uh, here's another uh, seizure. Let's play the video of this. And the point here is to uh, tell you about different types of seizures. This is not an epileptic seizure. It looks like an epileptic seizure, but it's not. This is what we call a psychogenic seizure. And it occurs in individuals uh, 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 due to uh, emotional reasons. It's not due to a brain disease. The brain waves are normal. But there are some emotional issues that need to be sorted out for this kind of events to uh, to get better. So the reason I'm showing you different types is to tell you how important it is for patients to be diagnosed accurately in an epilepsy monitoring unit. This patient, for example, took medication without need for anti-seizure medication because the real diagnosis was not epilepsy. The real diagnosis was some uh, psychiatric issues that needed to be handled by the specialist. So let's go back to the presentation and I'm going to... Uh, uh, continue with some generalities here before my colleagues take over. This is not to read, but this is just to show you that individuals with epilepsy are prone to have other issues as well. Pain disorders, uh, bipolar disorder, anxiety, ADHD, and others. So it's all connected. And also employment in individuals with epilepsy tends to be uh, threatened. Mortality in individuals with epilepsy is also high, as you see here, two to three times higher than the general population. All this tells us how important it is for us to try to achieve seizure freedom, uh, 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 no matter what it takes. And uh, the treatment is anti-seizure medications. So uh, Dr. Becker later will tell us about some of the newer ones. Uh, uh, but we also have to consider, uh, you know, specific populations such as women with epilepsy. And Dr. Sheff is going to talk about that. There are different kinds of epilepsy surgery that can help people who do not benefit only from medication. And there is also the deep brain stimulation and other electrical devices that can be implanted to help with, with the seizures. But finally, there is also the diet therapy, including ketogenic diet and the modified Atkins diet, which Dr. Chen will tackle uh, today. And uh, so despite treatment, more than 900 individuals continue to have seizures despite medications. And the goal uh, of any of treating any individual with epilepsy is to have no seizures and no side effects whatsoever. This is a quick picture from a surgery. Uh, sometimes in order to identify the seizure focus, the brain is exposed. Electrodes are placed on the brain like this, and then we record. And sometimes electrodes are placed within the substance of the brain like needle electrodes by a neurosurgeon to facilitate identifying the actual seizure focus uh, for possible resection. Finally, uh, we have done some research at GW, which was considered one of the top 100 stories of 2014, including consciousness. And this was done um, in patients with epilepsy. So uh, we found areas in the brain that, is that are responsible for consciousness and treating those areas may help reduce the chances of loss of consciousness when people have seizures. And this has led to a National Geographic documentary and to other documentaries internationally. This is a, a Korean one. So thank you very much for listening. I will I will leave it here. And our um, next speaker is uh, my colleague, Dr. Mackey, who is going to tell us about the importance of establishing the accurate diagnosis of events that look like epileptic seizures and whether they are epileptic seizure or something else. So Dr. Mackey, please go ahead.
Thank you, Dr. Kubesi. Thank you, everyone, for joining uh, this event. So, uh, just gonna wait for the slide. So, I'm I'm Yaman Maki. I'm an assistant professor of neurology at GW in the, the division of epilepsy. So, I'm gonna be talking about the mimickers of epileptic seizures and how to diagnose them. I'm gonna start with one uh, question that some of the patient asked me. My doctor told me I don't have epilepsy, but I'm still having seizures. So, we're gonna try to talk about the mimics or uh, uh, um, diagnoses that can be uh, or can mimic epileptic seizures. Mimickers uh, are often misdiagnosed and up to 30% of patients diagnosed with epilepsy actually don't have epilepsy. And some patients have in some studies up to 30% uh, suffer, uh, uh, who suffer from epilepsy can have other forms of events that are non-epileptic, which we're gonna talk about. It's very important to know the difference because you don't want to give a seizure medication to a person who's not having seizures, and the opposite is true. So basically, I'm going to try. I'm going to start with the, the the most common mimicker of uh, epileptic events or epileptic seizures, which is a psychogenic non-epileptic spells. One of the examples Dr. Kubesi showed in, showed in his videos. So it is the most common disease that mimics or look like epilepsy, but it is not. In, in some hospitals, some studies show that up to 50% of patients who are admitted to have a diagnosis of epilepsy turn out to have non-epileptic or uh, psychogenic spells or PNES. Like epilepsy, the symptoms in PNES can be very uh, variable and they differ from one patient to the other. It can be simply uh, uh, episodes of like tingling numbness on one side of the body up to like losing awareness with abnormal twitching movements, which can be very misleading and can be th thought of uh, epileptic seizures instead. I, I, I want to make sure that even some patients hear it from some physician that this is in your head to say to tell them that this is not uh, it's not an epileptic seizure. It's actually not. It is a real disease. It's a real uh, diagnosis that you're actually not aware of it. So these events happens, happens uh, usually and you're not really aware of these uh, events. Now, uh, it is believed that uh, psychogenic non-epileptic spells uh, are caused by deep, sometimes hidden emotional stresses or old traumas. It could be any type of abuse, even if you're not aware of it. Lots of patients, we tell them the diagnosis and they think, well, but I'm not stressed. Actually, it's more of a deep, can be hidden, uh, old stress. It's a way unconsciously our mind uh, and body channels uh, uh, unexpressed, uh, deep, hidden stresses. So let's say some people, when they get uh, anxious, they would have like abdominal pain, sometimes nausea. Guess what? You can have non-epileptic psychogenic spells as an expression of your deep stress. This can affect any age, pediatrics, adult, elderly any gender, and even patients with epilepsy uh, can have uh, non-epileptic psychogenic spells. So that's why it's essential to make the diagnosis, to know what we're treating and how to treat it. Now, basically, one important thing to mention uh, is that uh, in PNES, the brain activity is normal during the event. And I'm going to talk about it when I talk uh, 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 about how we diagnose these events. Uh, which is not the same for epileptic seizures. Now, other type of events that look like uh, uh, seizures but but are not, syncope. This is like, syncope is, is actually a loss of consciousness and muscle tone caused by decreased blood flow to the brain. You can get pale, you can have some sweating, you would have loss of consciousness, and even you can have some jerky abnormal movements in the arms and legs, and that's why we call it convulsive syncope. And that's why it's, it mimics sometimes seizures, but actually it's not. This is caused by abnormal uh, blood flow or, or uh, the blood flow to the brain goes low and can be caused by heart problem, by also even brain problem, nerve problem, and other causes, which I'm not going to go into details. We're going to show you here how the heart and the brain are connected. And if there is any abnormality in the flow to the brain of the blood, you can have a syncopal episode, which can look like a seizure. Other mimickers can be movement disorders. Some, some abnormal movements can be mistaken for seizures, such as tics, dystonias, which are kind of um, more violent, stiff movements can affect the arms, the face, the legs, etc. And this can be sometimes mistaken for seizures and treated as if they are epileptic events. Other episodes that affect the memory and even the psyche 
it's basically a condition we call it transient global amnesia. So we lose awareness, you lose not awareness, memory specifically for a certain period of time for a few hours, and then you go back to your uh, normal uh, memory and mentation. And these sometimes can be thought of to be seizures and can mimic seizures. So that's why it's important to make the diagnosis. Other presentations such as uh, specific psychiatric conditions, we call them dissociative behaviors or or even hallucinations, anything also can mimic seizures. And we, we also hear a lot of time from our, from our colleagues in psychiatry, they refer patients to us to make the, the, the diagnosis, whether these are seizures or not. So other mimickers also are sleep uh, disorders. Sleep problem also can mimic seizures. It can be simply twitches, like a partner or a wife, husband, they would, they would mention in clinic, well, they twitch at night. Sometimes uh, night terrors, even REM, uh, it's a, st a specific state of sleep during which we have dreams. If there is an abnormality uh, uh, during that, that uh, uh, stage of sleep, you can have abnormal movement that can look like seizures and can be mistaken for seizures and narcolepsy even. Other mimickers such as migraine, headaches, especially uh, can mimic seizures that are coming from an area of the brain, we call it the occipital lobe, which is responsible for vision, can also mimic seizures. And strokes also can mimic seizures. Now, how do we make the diagnosis? How do we make the difference, uh, whether, like, uh, know the difference, whether these are epileptic or non-epileptic? First step is history. O often when the history is not that clear or we don't have a diagnosis, we get referrals from uh, other specialties to to, to, to see whether these patients are having epileptic seizures or not. So we have to take a detailed history and know what's happening. The second step is to do some tests. So basically the main test that we do uh, that would help us is an EEG and an admission to the epilepsy monitoring unit. So technically, as you see here, we connect some electrodes on the brain and we have some on the screen, we see some brain waves. Uh, which would tell us whether these are normal or abnormal or would give us give us a hint if you have a tendency to have seizures. So basically, you patients would come to the epilepsy unit. This is a monitoring area where technicians would sit 24-7, which we have at GW Hospital, and they monitor patients. They, uh, they look at the EEG, and there is here also a video screen. So basically, we see the patient both what's happening in the brain while we see them what they are doing uh, on a video. So what happens is that when, we, when, when, when the patients come in, we, uh, we try to record the event, and based on what we see on the EEG and on the video, we try to make the diagnosis, whether this is an epileptic seizure or it's a non-epileptic seizure, let's say a psychogenic non-epileptic spell. So, then this would shape definitely the management. If we record seizures, we, we're gonna have a long discussions about what, what are the, the options of treatment. If we record non-epileptic seizures, this is, uh, this is the first step in the, in the diagnosis. And then we would have patients see a team of neurologists, which is mainly the epileptologists, psychiatrists, and even neuropsychotherapists. Now, uh, I'm going to open it now to the questions, and you please feel free to uh, write down any questions in the Q&A uh, section. So, I have a question here. Can you elaborate on how doctors are able to tell the difference, be the difference between PNES seizures and epileptic seizures? Definitely. So basically, uh, the, 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 main, the main test that is gold standard is the EMU. Like, so you bring the, the, you come into the epilepsy monitoring unit, we connect the EEG, uh, and we have the video recording that uh, records on a camera what's happening. So we try to record that event. We ask the patient if they have a specific trigger, we try to uh, accommodate that and uh, uh, try to push the event to happen. Now, basically, based on what we see the, on the EEG, if we have an event of shaking and the EEG is normal, this will give us a hint that this is a non-epileptic seizures. But we don't only rely on the EEG alone. We also rely on what we see on the video. So we look at the movements. Are the movements uh, uh, symmetric? Are they um, regular? Uh, how the patient is responding? 
We can also look into uh, uh, the duration of the event. So there are many clinical factors that we look into to make the diagnosis, both looking at the EEG and on the video on how the movements are. Can epilepsy cause vertigo? Well, some, uh, so some seizures, uh, some patients would re re report some uh, vertigo sensation, but it does like epilepsy wouldn't really cause vertigo by itself, like a diagnosis of vertigo. There, there, there should be other constellation of symptoms with it. Is a, an epileptologist, a, an expert in anti-seizure medications, and uh, as you probably know, there have been a lot of newer generation medications. And Dr. Becker is going to give us an update about the new kids on the block when it comes to treating an, uh, epilepsy with with meds. Okay. Um... I don't see my slides. Are these... Okay, great. Okay, so in this segment, I'm gonna be speaking about new medications for the treatment of epilepsy that have become available over the last two years. Uh, let's see. Okay. So if you look at the most recent data from the CDC from 2015, and Dr. Cabezzi spoke about this a little bit, there are 3 million adults in the U.S. with active epilepsy and 470,000 children. That means they have been diagnosed with epilepsy and are either taking medication to control it or have had one or more seizures in the past year or they're on medication and are still having seizures. From this study of 3 million adults with epilepsy in the United States, when they dug deeper, they found that 56% are still having seizures. So clearly there's room for improvement. The goals of treatment are no seizures and no side effects. We want to avoid a situation like this where the person decides not to take their medication and they end up in the hospital because of seizures. So you might ask, why do we need new treatments for epilepsy? Um, <laughs> that's not supposed to be there. Okay, with current medications, uh, in a recent study, the likelihood of becoming seizure-free is about 50% after the first medication. If you have to take a second medication, the chance of becoming seizure-free drops to about 11%, 11%. If a third medication is needed, the chance of seizure freedom, which is our goal, is 4%. Here's a chart that shows the history of development of anti-seizure medications. As you can see, many new medications have been available over time. I'll be talking about the most recent medications listed, and one more that was very recently approved, but has not yet made it to this list. We're going to discuss some medications that are taken daily to prevent seizures or chronic daily medications and medications that are taken at the time of the seizure to prevent a cluster of seizures, which I'll refer to as acute treatment. There are three new daily medications as listed on the screen, Sinopamate, Epidiolex, and Fenfluramine. The last two listed have a very narrow spectrum of action at present. There are also two new acute medications, midazolam nasal spray and diazepam nasal spray. The newest medication available is the one with the broadest potential for use, which is Sinovimate. It was approved in November of 2019 for the treatment of partial onset seizures, that is, focal seizures in adults. 
This diagram illustrates the difference between focal epilepsy and generalized epilepsy. On the left, the seizure begins in a specific focused area or localized area of the brain, whereas on the right, a generalized seizure starts, involves the whole brain all at once. What sets this medication apart are the results on seizure freedom. If you look at how many patients in the study stayed on the medication throughout the trial and became seizure-free, 10% were seizure-free at the end of the trial on the low dose, and 18% were seizure-free on the higher dose. This is compared to the older medications where the highest seizure-free rate was 6.4%. The most common side effects are fatigue, somnolence, dizziness, double vision, and headache. Very early in the study, there were three patients who developed symptoms of a very serious drug reaction called DRESS, drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. It's an allergic reaction that includes rash, fever, and a systemic reaction, which can be very serious. Since the dosing schedule was changed, there have been no subsequent cases. There are now two new medications that can be used to treat acute seizures, midazolam nasal spray and diazepam nasal spray. Previously, the only medication from 1997 until 2019 was diazepam rectal gel. These medications treat most types of generalized seizures, including grand mal seizures, both drugs can be used to treat a prolonged seizure or a cluster of seizures. Both are in the benzodiazepine family. You may have heard of medications Valium and Ativan. These are in the same, same type of medication. Both are administered as a nasal spray. Potential side effects include drowsiness, headache, nasal discomfort, uh, mild throat irritation, and runny nose. Respiratory depression was a concern uh, in theory, but in practice, when the studies were done, there were no issues seen with trouble breathing or respiratory depression. Use of the medications needs to be individualized. So you can't just prescribe the medicine and say, here, take this. It's gotta be a plan between you and your physician or provider as, as to how, when, and how it will be used and what type of situations it will be used. On the slide is a link to one type of seizure action plan, which is where you would put down the act how you would take it, when you would take it, and what type of situation. Midazolam nasal spray was approved in May 2019. And this is the actual approval, but the key thing is it's used, the language of the actual approval, but the key thing is used for seizure clusters or seizures that are different from your a person's typical seizures. And it's approved for patients 12 years of age and older. Whereas uh, diazepam nasal spray, it also has the same indication, but it can be used in children from six years to 12 years and anyone older than that. There have been no head-to-head -head studies to compare the two, so we don't know which one is better, if one is better than the other at this point. In the last few moments, I'm gonna to touch on a few medications which are indicated for specific neurologic and genetic conditions associated with epilepsy. The first is Epidiolex or CBD or cannabidiol. It's an extract from the marijuana plant. You've probably heard about this in different uh, venues. It has recently been approved for use in persons with seizures due to a genetic condition called tuberous sclerosis. It has previously been approved for individuals with neurodevelopmental syndrome, specifically Trevay syndrome and lennox gastaut syndrome. The last medication I'm going to mention is fenfluramine. It has also been approved for persons with seizures associated with Dravet syndrome. Dravet syndrome is a rare genetic syndrome where individuals have frequent difficult to control seizures that start during infancy. The major concern with this medication is the potential for damage to the heart and lungs. Because of this, anyone taking this medication has to be monitored with testing to monitor the heart and lung function. So in summary, this infographic from the CDC sort of sums things up. There remain a large number of persons with epilepsy that are still having seizures. If you have epilepsy, actions that you can take to improve your care include seeking and 
seeing an epilepsy specialist, working with your provider to manage epilepsy, having seizure management, having a seizure, seizure management plan and taking medication as prescribed. We talked about different medications, including Synovimate, which is used for treatment of patients with focal onset seizures. We talked about two new medications that can be used acutely to stop seizures, allowing a person, a family member, or a care provider to prevent prolonged seizures or clusters of seizures, and two other medications that have been shown to be effective for patients with very specific neurologic conditions associated with epilepsy. Uh, and I don't, I think we're gonna to go to the next speaker because I and take questions at the end, I understand. Terrific, thank you, thank you so much. So uh, you see the journey of a patient who uh, has uh, a paroxysmal event, you know, an event that results in loss of consciousness or some unusual behavior starts with the proper diagnosis uh, as we discussed, is it epilepsy? Is it not epilepsy? As Dr. Mackey discussed, and then if it's epilepsy, then medications are the first line treatment as Dr. Becker discussed. However, if the patient is a woman, specifically a woman in a childbearing age, uh, or a woman who wants to become pregnant or is nursing or has menstruation, there are specific considerations. And this is the next talk with Dr. Sheff. Thank you, Dr. Kubesi, and thank you all for attending today. Um, I am Anumeha Sheth. I am an um, assistant professor, this is not correct. Um, and I will be talking about um, special considerations specific to women uh, who have seizures and take seizure medications. So uh, I'll talk about a few different topics, um, starting with effect of hormones on seizures and vice versa, um, contraception and, pregnanc um, and pregnancy and beyond. So starting with just an introduction about the female hormones, they can impact seizures in a big way. Estrogen lowers seizure thresholds and can in, um, increase the tendency to have seizures. It can cause irritability in the brain. Progesterone, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. It can um, decrease the tendency to have seizures and it's also used as a treatment for seizures in certain cases. So um, as we all know, the recycling of hormones throughout the menstrual cycle and this can alter seizure threshold, um, leading to increased seizures around um, certain times of the or menstrual cycle. For example, uh, in some women, there is increased tendency to have seizures around the period. So around one third of women with epilepsy, specifically with focal seizures, have an um, hormone sensitivity, if you call it, um, um, to and, or tendency to have increased seizures at some points during the men menstrual cycle. Um, this condition doesn't really have any specific treatments, but uh, we try increasing their seizure medications around the time of expected increase. We also try benzodiazepines such as clonazepam, um, clobazam. We have, I have also used hormonal treatments, although there's no strong evidence yet of any particular treatment, uh, but we've used some. Um, moving on to contraception. So certain uh, medications such as dilantin, Topomax, Tegretol, Trileptol, they can decrease the level of steroid hormones, um, estrogen and progesterone in your body. So the oral contraceptive pill, which contains low dose of estrogen and progesterone, um, can be insufficient um, and um, might result in an accidental pregnancy. Um, on the other hand, there are certain seizure medications which are sensitive to the level of estrogen. Um, and if oral contraceptive medication is used, a pill is used with these medicines, such as Lamotrigine, um, it can cause decreased level of lamotrigine, leading to seizures in some cases. So both ways, um, oral contraceptive pills is not a very good option with certain seizure medications. So the general recommendation is uh, that IUD, um, intrauterine device, or a long-acting reversible progesterone implant should be recommended for women who take seizure medications. Um, so pregnancy and epilepsy is a very important topic. And uh, um, so I could talk about it for a long time, but briefly I would say, so sorry, what happened to the slide? Briefly, I would say that majority of women with um, um, 
with the majority of pregnancies in women with epilepsy are uh, fairly unremarkable and, and, and are normal. Um, women with epilepsy tend to have a higher rate of unintended pregnancies, but they have no more um, higher um, rate of infertility as compared to women without epilepsy. Uh, the time for achieving pregnancy um, and chances of achieving pregnancy are same as without uh, women who do not have epilepsy. So about 2% of women take seizure medications during their pregnancy and not just for epilepsy, women take seizure medications for pain disorders and psychiatric disorders as well. Majority of women uh, do not have any changes in seizure frequency during pregnancy. Some women can experience a decrease or increase, but the number is, is small. Uh, moving on to uh, specific seizure medication management during pregnancy. Um, so the most commonly used medications in pregnancy are Keppra, Levetrastam, and Lamotrigine, Lamictal, um, and even Trileptal. So they all uh, show a very uh, significant increase in clearance, meaning their level drops throughout pregnancy, So, which is important. Um, so target uh, concentration of the seizure medication in your blood should be determined before you even plan pregnancy. Um, and then the levels should be monitored every one to two months and doses should be adjusted um, uh, if seizures occur or if levels fall. Um, and then not only in pregnancy, this is also important after delivery, the doses should, should be adjusted and levels should be followed at least three to six months postpartum. Um, because again, because of various reasons, the uh, seizure medications uh, levels fluctuate, drop in pregnancy and increase after uh, um, birth, childbirth. So there is a um, major congenital malformation. Um, risk is a very significant issue uh, with the seizure medication exposure, specifically in the first trimester. So the seizure, major congenital malformation risk is slightly higher uh, with seizure medications. Um, and then it's a little bit higher if you're taking two or more medications. Specific uh, um, medications such as valproic acid, Depakote, um, carries a much higher risk as compared to some other medications like lamotrigine and levetrastam, Keppra. Uh, this risk is also dose dependent. So if you're on a very high dose of um, Depakote, um, you know, the risk goes high, up to 30, 35%. Um, so neurodevelopmental outcome, meaning IQ and development of the baby uh, born to uh, a woman who's taking seizure medication, um, this has been studied, um, and there is strong evidence that there is lower IQ um, at age six in children exposed to Depakote um, as compared to some of the other seizure medications. Um, and Depakote is, again, a culprit um, with uh, and is negatively correlated with uh, higher IQ, with, with IQ, meaning lower IQ, lower cognitive abilities, lower memory in, in these children. And there's also reports of autism and autism spectrum disorders. Um, in women uh, who, in children of women who are exposed to um, Depakote during pregnancy. But again, a majority of the medications do not cause such issues. Um, it's only certain medications, specifically Depakote, that you have to worry about. So um, there is very strong evidence that uh, use of folic acid, now folic acid is a B, B vitamin, um, around the time of conception, not just during pregnancy, but around the time of conception, results in higher IQ um, in, in children born to women with epilepsy, even if you adjust for factors such as, um, you know, IQ of, of the mother, et cetera. So um, folic acid supplementation, meaning all women of childbearing age are advised to um, take folic acid um, when they are plan planning pregnancy. Um, this is a recommendation by the American Academy of Neurology. Um, Moving on to my last topic, which is breastfeeding. So um, I'll just emphasize a couple of points here that higher IQ and verbal ability at age six has been demonstrated in children um, of um, mothers who um, are take seizure medications and breastfeed. Um, and then there is a risk of penetration of um, seizure medications during breast milk. But remember, this risk, this penetration is much lower and this exposure is much lower as compared to uh, during pregnancy through the placenta. So the American Academy of Neurology encourages breastfeeding uh, with close observation of the baby. Uh, 
So this is how my, this is the end of my slides and I will take questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, terrific, thank you so much. Uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, if medications fail to control seizures, uh, which is unfortunately the case in about one third of all individuals who have epilepsy, then we have to figure if the area in the brain that is producing the seizures could be potentially removed surgically uh, without causing major issues. This requires a lengthy workup, uh, but the mainstay, the one of the most important thing of that workup to identify the seizure focus is, in addition to EEG, is definitely imaging. Because if brain imaging shows you a little scar tissue or some other abnormality, then, uh, you know, it, it sort of uh, predicts that uh, surgery could be very helpful. And uh, Dr. Gallipur here is an expert in imaging, and he's going to tell us about imaging in, in epilepsy. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining for this webinar. Uh, as Dr. Kubesi said, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the technologies that we use for imaging uh, and things that are available to our center uh, for, for working our patients. So, um, as you heard so far, seizures can be uh, treated with medication, but sometimes we don't respond to, to the treatment with the medication. And then we need more tricks in our, in our bag to address those. Uh, Dr. Baker mentioned the difference between focal and generalized epilepsy. When there are focal epilepsies, there are uh, some uh, roles for surgery and other type of treatment. Um, so when you want to know where to treat, you want to know where the focus or where the source of the focal seizures are. That's what we call it so seizure focus here. Uh, but it's where the seizures start and spread to the rest of the brain. You want to identify that. Uh, the surgical treatment is uh, actually very effective for drug resistant epilepsy, but you know you need to know where to address that. So planning surgery is challenging when you don't know where the focus is or you're not certain. Uh, when we do imaging, we get more clues of where to target for, for either surgery or for stimulations, and treatment, and other things that like Shen will talk about uh, later. Uh, I usually uh, use the example of satellites uh, and how you map the center, the, the surface of the Earth uh, from the sky. So you want to find something there that is abnormal, we can use satellites. The same thing, we use the technology of MRI, for example, and the software that accompanies that to, to go and find in, the, in this planet that we, is inside our head, uh, where is that we have to address for, for treatment of epilepsy and how to learn about the normal uh, function of the brain. Uh, the imaging technology is rapidly growing, similar to every other things in the in the computer related uh, in technology and medical imaging. We had initially our uh, big goal was to make bigger and stronger magnets uh, that create MRIs, and now we have up to seven Tesla available to us. But there's also uh, part of that is the, the software that is improving and the, and the uh, technology in analyzing the data. Uh, MRI by far is the most important or useful tool to find a suspected seizure focus. Uh, most people with epilepsy had an MRI at some point, but you have to keep in mind that MRI that you had 10 years ago is not the same as today. For MRI done in a center that is not tuned for, for epilepsy treatment is not the same as doing it somewhere that they are used to treat epilepsy and work that up. So there is a big challenge that we have with our patients that are refractory to medication is that they say, well, I've done an MRI and they said, oh, MRI is normal, so why am I having seizures? Now, things that you can think of right away are, is that this normal MRI is in code, right? So it's, if there's a focal epilepsy, some part of the brain is generating this seizure. Sometimes this focus is too small or discrete that we can't detect it with the current MRIs by the radiologist's eye. So they are too small or too blurry, and you can't really call them abnormal. There is also this problem of inadequate quality of MRI. There are movements in the MRI. There is uh, there's an old scanner, or there is an equipment problem, or it's not tuned for finding the seizure focus, what we call it the seizure protocol. Um, and so if you repeat it, you may actually get better results. The other thing is that you need a person who's experienced in interpreting those MRIs for the, this purpose. You know, if someone looking at an MRI for finding a stroke or a tumor is different from finding a focus for seizures and addressing the treatment. So that also you want to be in the center that 
uh, is a kit for doing that. Now, there is some situations that uh, it's not focal epilepsy, it's a generalized epilepsy, or some other kind of conditions, mimickers of focal epilepsy, then there will be no focus. But that also, you have to make sure that you, you, do your, you get your best image of the brain. And as I said, it might be not epilepsy, and, and then, you know, uh, at least, you know, the MRI is normal. Now, what we can do to address this first issue of too small or discrete is to make better scanners and better structural imaging to see the details of the brain. Now, back to my uh, example of uh, satellites, you, you know, in this Google Earth, we see, uh, this is our neighborhood in Washington, D.C., and see an enhanced image of the street, even the, the uh, little uh, objects in the street, uh, and uh, that's because there's better hardware and it's also better software used by the satellites and the satellite images to show the detail. The same way, you know, this uh, three Tesla good quality, three Tesla scanner, which is the conventional strength of scan that we do, uh, most of the centers, uh, will show this little, if you see that little arrow, some abnormality there. That may not be apparent to everyone or people may not be feel strong enough to go after it for, for treatment. But this other example with a much stronger scanner and also with computer reformatting, make it very hard to miss that there is an abnormality there that you know, could be a source of seizure. So that's how we improve with uh, getting higher resolution images. Other than looking at different structure in the surface of the brain, we also can, uh, can uh, image the connections between the region of the brain. There are cables that connect different parts. You can learn how the seizures go from one side to the other side of the brain. And also we can have a cable map to give it to our surgeon to make sure that you know, when they're removing the abnormal part, they don't they avoid uh, these, these pathways. So it's called tractography and they, you know, they get very cool images of the brain, but the, the real purpose is to learn about how these things are moving from one side to the other side or where the normal structures are. Now, if the font structure or still image is normal, doesn't mean that this, the, that brain is not generating seizures. Uh, it might be too small, uh, the focus, to, to be seen. But you know, we can try to get a functional image that see that brain in action. One of the way and old ways of doing that, and we still do it uh, very efficiently, is that to use nuclear imaging. We can give glucose that has tracers, radionuclear tracers that go to the brain, the same way imaging that they do for the heart to see which part of the heart has, has a problem, you can do that for the brain. And, you know, the brain is very hungry for glucose or sugar. So we can do this PET imaging or positron emission tomography imaging uh, to see for look for the regions that take too much or too little glucose that, uh, you know, can identify part of the brain that are abnormal function, even if they look normal and uh, on the still image. And that's, that's a suspected region. Another way of doing it is using the MRI itself to look at the function. Uh, this method is called fMRI or functional MRI. Uh, we do it routinely for our patients, usually for finding the regions that are causing, that, that are uh, uh, in the uh, generation of speech or moving limbs or vision, regions that are essential for your essential function. And uh, by, by doing that, we can map the brain and know where are regions that are important to avoid if there is a surgery done or, you know, they assess the risk of surgery or the type of treatment that we want to do. Uh, these functional maps um, can tell the surgeon where to avoid and the risk of deficit from surgery. There are more use that, you know, is, is still in the research phase, but it's rapidly moving into uh, uh, daily clinical use is to find out which part of the brain uh, has a different function from the other part when there is abnormality on the EEG. So you can actually look at the EEG of this patient, for example, that there is some, uh, it's not a full-blown full seizure, but it's, it's a reminiscence of the seizure that the patient has. In the structural image, there are some abnormalities there that, you know, some so a good neuroradiologist will see it and say, hey, this is not uh, normal and this is probably what's causing seizures. But if you look here in the fMRI, you can actually see that these regions of the brain are using more oxygen. They have more neurology, uh, more neuron activity uh, during this event. So that tells us that there is a network here of the brain that is involved in generating seizures, and that helps us a lot to address that. Uh, with that, so you know, as as you see, there are structures and functions that we can look at and and predict what we are dealing with when we are going to go to the next level of treatment. I often uh, compare the brain to peaks and valleys and canyons. 
if you're going to go to somewhere like that, you know, you want a good map. You don't want to get lost there and you want to find your way very fast. So uh, that's why, you know, the uh, cutting edge imaging is very important for, for advanced treatment. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to get the questions at the end of this session, at the end of the whole session. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, our last talk uh, will be by uh, Dr. Chen. Uh, so again, we're sort of going through the whole journey uh, and we're choosing a difficult journey just to show you the, uh, whole, the, the, the whole spectrum of treating epilepsy. So we started with proper diagnosis, that it's seizure. We considered medications, then we considered specific uh, uh, con uh, considerations in women with epilepsy. And then we talked about imaging and surgery, but then if the patient fails medications and if the patient uh, is not a surgical candidate or even undergoes surgery but continues to have seizures, what are the remaining options? The remaining options include either electrical stimulation via specific devices, but also diet therapies. There, are, there have been studies about specific diets that showed uh, significant seizure reduction in individuals with epilepsy, and Dr. Chen is gonna teach us about uh, these modalities. Thank you, Dr. Kubesi. Good afternoon and welcome to the Epilepsy app, uh, app webinar. So here, oh. so here, I'm going to uh, first I have two polls. I have two polls and uh, I think you may have it. Yeah, it seems I also need to submit before I further go through. This is a second poll. Do you know about the diet therapy for epilepsy? Okay, so those are the two polls. So now, here. So we just uh, like to talk about the treatment of the epilepsy and uh, we went over like the anti-seizure medications and the brain surgery and uh, mainly the reception of the seizure foci. So think about the epilepsy is part of the brain is unhealthy. And if you can take out that part of the unhealthy brain, then hopefully, epilepsy will be cured. However, sometimes the part of the unhealthy brain, either it's too diffuse or it just happened to be in a very important area which you cannot take it out. Because when that part of the brain take out, patients may have like a neurological deficit, which is unacceptable. So that can be like another option in, that, in, that, in those cases. So there are other therapy methods. And um, that's where we are focused on the neuromodulation and the diet therapy. So first, the neuromodulation. There are two, well, now they have three, but mainly are those two, the neuromodulation methods I'm going to talk about. And the first is called VNS, vagus nerve stimulation. Vagus nerve is a nerve like, uh, it's, on, it's basically all over, all over human's body. And, uh, so it goes to like from the brain goes down all over to the body and in the neck. And if you see this yellow line, this is a vagus nerve. And the surgery, what they do is they put kind of like the pacemaker, there's a pocket on the chest and there's a generator in that pocket. And then there's like electrode goes wide to the vagus nerve, which is like the yellow line there. And that generator will send the regular mild pulse to the like of the electrical engineer to the brain and through that vagus nerve. Basically, the pulse will go to this vagus nerve. And as I mentioned, the vagus nerve goes all over the body, including all over the brain. Then it will go to the brain. And this is how it will, how it worked and to treat the seizures. So then next. So this is another type of the neuromodulation method. It's called a uh, responsive neurostimulation. So this is a little different. So this, you consider this is a smart device. So the device itself will detect the seizures. And for I'm sure everyone knows, for people have seizures, and those we call a paroxysmal, which means people have diagnosed with epilepsy. People do not have seizure 24-7. People may have seizure once a week, once a month, or once every three, four months. And the seizure itself duration is maybe one minute, or maybe three minutes, or maybe like 10 seconds. 
So most time people are not seizing. So this device is considered a smart device and it will detect the seizures and it send the pulse of the, it still send the electrical energy to the, to the brain, but it's only send it when it detects seizures. So it's not like the continuous send the pulses. It's just the way that the device detects seizures and then it sends the pulse. And also it needs to be directly, the stimulation needs to be directly in the part of the brain, which, uh, which we call the seizure foci, which means that part of the brain generates seizures. And uh, if like the device is placed in somewhere else, the stimulation was placed on somewhere else, first of all, the seizures are not even generated there, so it won't detect any seizures. Second of all, if the seizures finally, eventually seizures spread there, but when at that time, like send the stimulation or treatment, it will be too late. We want to the treatment start earlier, which means we want to be exactly at the way the seizure started at. So that is how it works. So next. So this is a comparison of the VNS, vagus nerve stimulation and of responsive neural stimulation. So first is a stimulation site. The VNS, of course, it's a vagus nerve and a vagus nerve on the neck, it's a stimulation site. And the INS, it's a brain. It's supposed to be on the, it should be on the seizure focus, not like a random site in the brain. And uh, the VNS does not detect the seizure and the neural pace INS detect the seizure itself. And the stimulation setting, like a VNS is regularly, you set up the device to send a stimulation regularly. The INS is as needed when the device finds a seizure. And the VNS does need a surgery, but it's kind of like a pacemaker surgery. It does not need the intracranial surgery, neural pace, uh, INS does need it. And both are FDA approved. VNS is about two decades, and INS is about now it's eight years now to approve by the FDA. So next, I'm going to quickly talk about the diet therapy for epilepsy. So mainly I will focus on the ketogenic diet or ketogenic. Ketogenic diet is like, a, you think about this is an umbrella and uh, it's an umbrella of the a variant of diet. And uh, ketogenic, it basically means a high fat diet and it can be used to treat seizures. As a matter of fact, this is not something new. It, we have known this for fat for quite a few years. And uh, the high fat diet is, and you can use like a heavy cream oil, butter, those are the main like the components of those high fat. And uh, also important is carbohydrates are limited. So basically high fat, low carbs, this diet. So those are the ketogen, uh, ketogenic diet variants. They have different types. For example, a classic ketogenic diet. And the three to one means like the three proportion of the, uh, of the food or calories are from the fat and only one are from like the protein and the carbohydrates. And uh, you may heard about the Actins diet. They have some commercial you may see in different media and they have the Actins diet. I believe they even have those package uh, the they packed uh, like uh, actin diet you can even order online so but for the seizures or treat epilepsy oh go back okay here. for treat the epilepsy mainly we use the either keto keto diet or modified actin diet modified actin diet uh, and compared to regular actin diet basically they have more fat and the classic ketogenic diet and the fat is um, uh, have the highest proportion of the fat. And the Atkins diet, it's still more, more fat than the regular diet, but it's less compared to the modified Atkins and the classic keto diet. And they have some other diet, like the low glycemic index diet, and some people use it for losing weight or other, uh, other like reasons. So. Also, this is the comparison of the diet. So this is the typical American diet. And uh, it have like a good proportion of the carbs and then the rest is a fat and a protein. For the actin diet, or this is a modified actin diet, and uh, most of them will be fat actually, and the carbs are limited. Protein actually still have a good amount of the protein. 
So this is a sample of the high fat, low carbs protein. And uh, uh, here I have all those listed as a food. And the bottom line is like the take home message is it's high fat, moderate protein and a low carbs. And you don't have to have the high protein. And also it like uh, uh, focus on the fresh and the whole foods. And the food is measured on the food label and the measuring cup. You do not need a scale to measure the food, but you want to use some measuring cups. And there's no restriction of the total amount of the calories taken. So, and uh, well, so that's actually the basically a uh, uh, a few sentences about this diet and the neural modulation and about the more. Oh. <laughs> so about more and for like the medication, the diet is not for everyone and we do need some monitoring. So it's not something people just start at home by by him or herself. And we do have this clinic and we have the a uh, seizure doctor and also we have a dietitian and uh, to pair it together to see people for those for people who have those needs. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I see some uh, questions here. I will, uh, let me go through them and I maybe I answer some and I forward some to you guys. Uh, the First question, I think, is to Dr. Mackey. Is PNES psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, are they hereditary? I'm not aware of any specific hereditary, uh, you know, predisposition for uh, non-epileptic. They're not. Obviously, some mood disorders can be seen more if somebody has family history of depression. They can be prone to have depression, which increase, increases the risk of PNES. But I'm not aware of that. It is uh, no, it's not. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. Uh, the, the, we don't know of any genetic basis for PNES, but one of the things uh, uh, that have has been studied and uh, repeatedly uh, found to be consistent in the literature is that if the person uh, has had a, any kind of psychological trauma whether it is a veteran during the war or whether it is some domestic trauma or what have you, they tend to have higher chances of developing these psychogenic seizures, which are, like I said, resemble epileptic seizures, but they are due to some emotional issues. Uh, so we have another uh, question. Uh, well, uh, before I go to the other question, somebody asked whether this is going uh, to be archived or available for later viewing because uh, there were some disconnections and the answer is yes. Uh, it is being recorded and it will appear on our website, on the GW Hospital website. Uh, so another question, is it all right to take ADHD medication with epilepsy medications? I can answer that. Uh, the answer is yes. So uh, indeed, ADHD is more common in individuals who have epilepsy than in those who don't. For example, if you, if you take a thousand individuals with epilepsy and a thousand people with no epilepsy, you'll find higher percentage of ADHD in the epilepsy population. Uh, a lot of our patients have it and they receive uh, all sorts of medications uh, for ADHD uh, 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 together with their anti-seizure medications. It's a very good question though because if you look at the data for some anti-ADHD uh, medications, you may, you may find that they may increase the chances of seizures. Uh, this is correct, and uh, but it doesn't uh, uh, preclude using these medications at low doses in individuals with epilepsy, uh, because you know the, the benefit outweighs the risk. Uh, and then uh, I can uh, I can answer the following question: Can you talk about the correlation between autism and epilepsy? Well, autism similar to ADHD, autism is more common in individuals who have epilepsy, and those who have epilepsy are more uh, likely to have autism. So if you look at different kinds of studies, if you look at any you know uh, population, if you look at all individuals with autism spectrum disorders, you will find a higher percentage of epilepsy than those who don't have autism and vice versa. So there is some correlation. Um, and uh, the, the, the basis for that, meaning the uh, the actual uh, 
chemical basis, what chemicals may be in the brain or neurotransmitters may be responsible for this sort of intersection is being studied uh, actively by multiple researchers. Um, so there is this sort of uh, correlation. But obviously, the, the majority of people who have autism, they don't have epilepsy. The majority of people who have epilepsy, they don't have autism. But there is some correlation still. Uh, I think I will uh, forward the next question to Dr. Sheff. Uh, I have had seizures that are uh, controlled by my subconscious, uh, which means, oh, it's, it changed. Wait, I lost my... Uh, I think, what, did it disappear? I think the question was about seizures that the individual could control them at least temporarily, uh, you know, like suppress them temporarily, but then later they come back and is this habitual in epilepsy? Uh, I think that was the question, but I don't see it any longer. Uh, perhaps you can address it. It's under, under the published um questions yeah so i have had seizures that are controlled by my subconscious which allows me to complete tasks then i'll have a seizure afterward is this common um so i i, I mean i i don't uh clearly know what the subconscious means here and we can answer that but uh i feel that the idea is that there are some people have se small seizures or sometimes they call it aura that you can have you can continue to do what you're doing during that time, but later you may have a bigger seizure that can uh, affect your consciousness. So it's not uncommon for people with focal epilepsy to first have smaller seizures that involve a small part of the brain and don't con completely affect their consciousness. Uh, but those are telltale of that there is the, the brain is at risk of having developing seizure. And you know even if you have, don't have convulsions uh, and lo don't lose consciousness and still have those small events, it's important to discuss that with your uh, neurologist, and it means that maybe there might be some tuning in the medication that we can do to improve the control. Uh, if that was the type of, uh, it was the correct uh, answer. And uh, Dr. Kubesi, there's anything else? That my understanding of the subconscious is the things that, that does not affect the consciousness. Yes, uh, so basically, uh, uh, if you feel that you can uh, suppress the seizure temporarily and then when it's uh, when you finish a certain task, it comes back. Uh, I mean, one of the possibilities is that it's not a seizure. And the other possibility is that it's a seizure, but it started as an aura that is prolonged during which you were able to complete the task before it propagated further. Uh, the third thing, it could be psychological stress. I mean, there are all sorts of uh, a phenomena that can explain this. The quick answer is not, a presentation like this is not very common in the epilepsy clinic, but when we hear something like this, uh, we become eager to find out the actual story. And to do so, we need to capture such events uh, with the EEG being recorded, either in an ambulatory setting, meaning at home or in the hospital. This is the importance of establishing uh, uh, diagnoses uh, via uh, video EEG monitoring, uh, which we do uh, all the time at GW Hospital. Uh, I think there's something that is related to Depakote, uh, Dr. Becker. I'll read the question. I can uh, take that if you want. Dr. Or Dr. Sheth, yes, please go ahead. Uh, so I think first. the question is, in general, neurology categorize epilepsy level of uh, severity? I would say yes. Uh, seizures have a spectrum from less severe, which can be just um, seizures without loss of any kind of awareness, you you know, you remain aware through it um, and they last a very short time. That doesn't cause much injury or morbidity. But um, on the other hand, on the other hand of the spectrum are, you know, generalized tonic clonic seizures or seizures that go on for a very long time, more than five minutes called status epilepticus. So that is associated with 20% chance of, you know, mortality. So yes, there is a, there is a categorization um, in terms of severity. So I understand that, so Depakote is a very, very effective medication and um, especially in idiopathic generalized epilepsy or primary generalized epilepsy, it's very, very effective. And this is why we run into this conundrum with the uh, young women or girls of uh, you know childbearing age um, because it's a very effective medicine and some patients, Depakote is the only thing that would work. And the question then becomes that, what do we do when they plan to have children? And it's not an easy answer. 
it's a very nuanced answer and this is why um uh, you know, you need to have a discussion with your neurologist. But I agree, Depakote is a very effective medication. All right. Uh, the next question uh, is, I am one of those people who do not recommend surgery. I had surgery and have had to increase my medication, still have seizures. Um, and there were some side effects. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, this happens. But let's let's look at the numbers to see if surgery should continue to be recommended or not. Numerous studies have, have shown, and I think Dr. Becker mentioned this in, in one of his slides, that if two medications fail to control seizures, the chances of good seizure control with further medication regimens become really slim. It becomes less than 10%, maybe four to 6% or something like that. With the newer generation drug that was mentioned, it goes a little higher, but it's still very small chance of achieving complete seizure freedom. Uh, whereas epilepsy surgery uh, in certain situations has chances that reach up to 80% of achieving seizure freedom. Obviously, it ranges between 50 and 80. So in those people who are considered good surgical candidates, epilepsy surgery definitely is much more superior to continued medical treatment. However, I say 80%, so that means what happens to the remaining 20%? That means the remaining 20% will continue to have seizures. And there are other studies that have shown uh, 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 that when redo surgeries are done, meaning when repeat epilepsy surgeries are done, another significant proportion of individuals uh, become seizure-free. So there are people who become seizure-free after two epilepsy surgeries. Obviously, we don't like to do that if we can do one surgery, but unfortunately some epilepsies are very difficult to localize or to include totally in one resection and it may take longer. So that's why uh, the journey of some individuals with epilepsy is a little bit uh, cumbersome and lengthy, but uh, uh, if surgery is recommended, that means the team of physicians caring for you uh, has information that suggests a very good chance of achieving good outcome. Medicine is not an exact science. Nobody will be able to say surgery will achieve complete seizure freedom 100%, but they will tell you 80% or 70% or 60%, which is good enough uh, compared to continued medical treatment. However, there will be those 20% or 30% who will have seizure recurrence and they need to continue to be evaluated. So I hope that what uh, my answer uh, ameliorates the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, opinion about epilepsy surgery in general and uh, 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 resuscitates the conversation with your physician about this modality if uh, uh, they find you to be uh, a good surgical candidate. Um, so uh, I would just like to add that Dr. Golipur emphasized in his talk that the technology has advanced a lot as compared to what it was 10 or 15 years ago, and that applies to epilepsy surgery too. So if the epilepsy surgery was done decades ago or several years ago, I, I, the technology is a little bit better now. So I, I would like to add that. Yeah, and also I mentioned is like the surgery have different type of the surgery. I'm not sure in that particular case what type, but they have different options. Sometimes if the receptive, which means take part of the brain out is the, too much to lose and will cause significant deficit. So in those cases, people will may consider the neural motivation. And uh, so they have different options and also like the other therapies. So, yeah. Yes, totally. Thank you. I think the next question, Dr. Becker, is for you. It's about rectal diastat. Uh, it says, if in the past clusters did not stop with rectal diastat, is there a reason to believe that the nasal spray could work? I would consider that because giving rectal diastat, one can take a long, can take more time to actually administer. So you're losing time from the time of seizure onset. Whereas with the nasal form, you can take that almost immediately if it's available. Um, the other piece would be that because of the way of administration of rectal diastat, it's there's always a question whether it was given and the full dose was able to be given. So I think it's definitely worth looking into, uh, along with the seizure action plan, as and trying that as an alternative. Uh, 
All right. Uh, thank you. Um, I think maybe Dr. Mackey may, may take the next question. Um, do you think deep emotional stress could cause epilepsy? Uh, my husband was dying from GBM when I had my first seizure, and since then I've been diagnosed with epilepsy. We're so sorry to hear. Uh, but uh, maybe Dr. Mackey can talk about the relationship between stress and epilepsy, which was actually the subject of a recent uh, symposium at GW. I'm sorry to hear about your husband, but, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, emotional stress can definitely uh, trigger in uh, seizures if somebody has the tendency of have epilepsy, but it's not like a cause-effect relationship. It's not like a cause uh, to cause epilepsy. Now, other than that, there are some studies like that, studies like the, the relationship between depression and epilepsy, and there is kind of a bi-directional relationship. I hope I answered the question. So to, to, to reiterate, uh, if somebody has a tendency for epilepsy, then stress will increase their seizures. But if somebody does not have epilepsy in the first place, stress alone, psychological stress alone, is unlikely to cause new epilepsy. In other words, uh, the conclusion is that there were, there, if epilepsy is now diagnosed, then there was probably some tendency for it in the first place. Um, and then uh, there is uh, Dr. Becker, please. What about medical marijuana? Is GW doing any part of this, any of that research? So medical marijuana can mean many different things. It can, and that marijuana, there's CBD and THC. Those are two main, the two main components. Epidiolex, which I spoke about, is really the only approved treatment for epilepsy, and it's a very narrow treatment. So uh, there are, it is being used uh, in some individuals with refractory seizures, but it's not, medical marijuana itself is not been approved and is not, uh, we're, I'm not using it for patients with refractory epilepsy at this point. If I were to use it, it would be, ep, it would be Epidiolex uh, that would be used. Um, I'm not aware of any studies that we're doing on medical marijuana. All right. Uh, we have a question about uh, the relationship between aura and panic attacks. Can an aura present like a panic attack? Any of the faculty would like to take that? Dr. Sheth, maybe? I can, take it. Yeah, I can take it and I can take the next one about menopause. Um, so aura can totally present like panic attack in some patients and the symptoms can be very similar. Um, I have personally had patients who thought they had a um, diagnosis of panic attack for several years and decades and were actually found to have seizures. Um, the symptoms that can be similar are, um, you know, feeling of unexpected fear, anxiety, um, heart racing, flushing, some of the symptoms can manifest um, in epilepsy as well. So yeah, it can. Um, the only way to diagnose it is to uh, do an EEG, preferably a long EEG with video, um, and capture these episodes and figure out whether these are seizures or not. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, maybe I just uh, like, yeah, go uh, ahead. just uh, jump in a few sentences. So, so yes, as Dr. Chess mentioned, uh, yes, like the panic attack can be an aura. However, first of all, like uh, the more likely panic attack is just a panic attack. So as just Dr. Shia said, to be final confirm, a lot of times we do need to do those more investigation. And I believe someone asked earlier about the vertigo. Yes, the vertigo can be the symptom of the seizure, but most likely people have vertigo is for some other reasons to have vertigo. So the bottom line is the seizures sometimes can be very tricky. And uh, a lot of times people think about seizure are just a shaking commotion, but actually that's not true. A lot of times seizure can have all different kinds of the presentation. But on another hand, those presentation doesn't necessarily mean seizure either. So it's basically, it depends on like the whole picture and the need for the investigation sometimes. Yeah. And then the menopause question, Dr. Okay. Shen. So yeah, there are a few things. So the, it's it's a pretty broad topic and there, there are several things to consider here. So I'll just mention a few things. So seizures can worsen and in my experience have worsened in some women. Perimenopausally means when they're undergoing menopause. 
um, they can sort of worsen a bit in some women and then sort of and stabilize after menopause is completed because of the hormonal fluctuations. Um, if you are taking hormonal uh, replacement therapy, that is a little bit risky. And I think I, you know, talk to your doctor about that because it usually contains estrogen, which can lower seizure threshold. And already the hormonal balance is a little bit tricky around menopause. So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing I would like to talk about is bone health in postmenopausal women with epilepsy. Certain medications, like I think you mentioned Tegretol in the next question, can worsen bone health and cause um, increased tendency for osteoporosis, especially in postmenopausal women. And if you're taking Tegretol, that increases. So, um, you know, uh, one consideration would be vitamin D level, vitamin D, D supplementation, DEXA scans, and trying to avoid medications that can accelerate osteoporosis like Tegretol. Um, so yeah, I hope I hope that answers it. So bone health is a very important um, thing to consider um, in postmenopausal women with epilepsy. Uh, and then uh, taking Tegretol for 30 years, seizure free, recommend EMU testing to determine further need. Well, uh, I could probably take that. So uh, if you've been seizure free for 30 years, then it's definitely a very legitimate question to assess further need and whether you could just discontinue the Tegretol and, uh, uh, and continue to be seizure free. Obviously, this is a hypothesis that requires testing. The first thing we do is to obtain uh, uh, an EEG. The EEG uh, could be just one hour, but it could be a whole day. So the EMU in particular here is not a, a strict indication. Obviously, the more we record, the better to see whether there are still some spikes. Uh, and the spikes on the EEG, they signify continued need to keep medications on board. Um, but uh, there hasn't been a, a clear study to, to tell us about whether longer EEGs, like over days, such as in the EMU, Uh, are better predictors of seizure recurrence after discontinuation of medication than just routine EEG done for one hour. The bottom line is that you will have to discuss with, with, with the neurologist whether just a routine EEG will be done or if it makes you feel better and more confident, a whole day or uh, 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 multiple days are done. And after that, then the Tegretol could be discontinued by lowering it very gradually, very slowly over weeks. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, things that I want to mention here is whenever we lower and discontinue a medication, this will entail refraining from driving and following other seizure precautions, such as swimming or bathing without supervision, standing on heights, doing any activity that could cause potentially harm in case of the seizures come back. And uh, a lot of people uh, whom we offer to discontinue the medicine They say, no, we would like to stay on it because my lifestyle currently does not allow me to refrain from driving temporarily. So these are some of the considerations. But the bottom line is that you need EEG, definitely. Uh, it doesn't need to be necessarily EMU admission. Uh, okay, so now we go to uh, the last question uh, that I see on my list here. I'm on my third medication for seizures. While it appears that the new meds are working, one month finally free after two years of trying op options, there are some pretty awful side effects at times. My doctor stated that my body will adjust or has suggested that this is just how this is going to be in terms of an exchange for a freedom of head banging. How long should a body allow adjustment before exploring further options or Uh, medication. I can answer this very quickly and then uh, perhaps ask if any of my colleagues has something to add, uh, because this is something that we deal with. I think every epilepsy doctor deals with a question of that sort. And uh, my answer is that the goal of treating epilepsy, as Dr. Becker said, and as I, I said in general, is no seizures and no side effects. If a medicine makes you completely seizure free, but it results in horrible side effects that affect your quality of life, that means uh, something should be done about that medication. Maybe keep it on board, but lower the dose, or maybe replace it altogether by something else. Um, now, depends, there are some side effects that are self-limited. For example, when we start certain medications, the patient may feel dizziness uh, or even sleepiness uh, for a week or two or up to three, and then it goes away on its own. 
We've seen this with Kepra, we've seen it with Aptium, we've seen it with uh, Synodomate, Excopri. Uh, it tends to get better on its own, but it doesn't always uh, get better on its own. Sometimes it goes away in a month, but if it doesn't, you're, the doctor will, uh, and uh, you and the doctor will have to have an important conversation about balancing side effects with, uh, uh, with seizure control. And I don't know if anybody would like to add anything. And uh, the last question that I see now is about Synodomate and possibly Dr. Becker can uh, answer that. So Synodomate, as we saw, was a very effective medicine, but I think a lot depends on evaluating what's happening. If, if one is on levetiracetam and is it the things is oxycarbazepine, is that controlling your seizures and what are the side effects? Uh, Synovimate has not been used as monotherapy as a single agent yet, so we really don't know how effective it is. When it was studied, it was added onto other drugs. So you may, if you do try that, you may go through a period of more side effects. Um, so it, it's a, you have to look at what's happening to you now versus, versus uh, what the med new medicine may provide without the other medications. And we don't know about Synovimate monotherapy yet. Terrific. Well, thank you all for the great questions and thank you, colleagues. Uh, and thank you, uh, Courtney and, and Julie. Uh, I hope we get to do this again and I hope we get to meet many of you uh, in person. Uh, uh, Courtney, would you like to say uh, a word about uh, this program becoming available online, the recording of this uh, for people who would like to, uh, to attend it later? I think here, here it is actually, the answer comes from the slide, gwhospital.com slash epilepsy. If you go there, uh, you will probably find this uh, recording uh, uploaded uh, uh, shortly. Um, and uh, please uh, keep this number uh, in case you have any questions uh, to address to any of us or would you like to schedule an appointment. And thank you um, everybody uh, for attending and have a great day.